you have a copy of God's Word with you this morning, we hope that you do, I'd invite you to turn to Nehemiah chapter 6. It's Nehemiah 6. Nehemiah chapter 6, read the first verse and half of the second verse and then we'll pray and then we'll move forward from there. Nehemiah 6 verse 1, now it happens. That, that already gives us a bit of an insight into, uh, okay, now something's a bit different, okay? The old saying is, you know, the more things change, the more they stay the same. Same and change sometimes can kind of go together. You'll maybe see a little bit of that as we proceed on through Nehemiah 6. But now it happened when Samballot, Tobiah, Geshem the Arab, and the rest of our enemies heard that I had rebuilt the wall and that there were no breaks left in it, though at the time I had not hung the doors in the gates that Sanballat and Geshem sent to me, saying, Father in heaven, we just want to thank you for your sweet presence and for your word and for being so personal to us that you speak. And now is your time, Father, to speak, teach, and preach. Please have your way. Once again, we thank you for the cross, for the empty tomb, but most of all for Jesus. Have your way, we pray, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. What's unique about this form of opposition in Nehemiah 6? Well, this kind of goes back to this past Thursday. I mentioned very briefly, been able to go over for the last uh, three weeks and spend some precious time with Miss Alice. And uh, what we've been able to do, she and I, is connect with each other through pictures on my phone. Uh, I found one day when we had a family in the dining area with me that it was quite a competition for us to communicate with our family members and friends who were a little hearing challenged. And not quite knowing how to work through that, I just decided I'd pull a few pictures out and I would show Miss Alice and we'd just kind of see where conversation went. I shared last week, I believe, about the fact that I pulled the same picture out twice just to kind of see where we were that particular day and she called me out on it. Well, that's the same picture you pulled out about 10 minutes ago. She was right. So this past week, as we were kind of working through some conversation together, and we were the only ones there for the most part, and it was a good day. The color was good, and she came around the corner, and she knew me right off the bat, and she would usually ask me how Mom's doing. But I pulled a picture off my phone of Anita and I. In fact, it's my wallpaper on my phone. And when she looked at that, she said, uh, and I did that so she could see Anita's face. But it was my face that she took note of. And here's what she said. She said, I can tell by your face in the picture you're thinking about Nina's. <laughs> okay, she may have all been right. But... Here's where that memory and that recollection might come from because she's brought this up to me a couple of times, maybe even a few times more. Miss Alice and I have known each other for years and years, and we worked a lot of hours together at the Hobnob. There was one incident, and she's brought this up to me more than once recently, okay, about an, a, a day shift that she worked, first shift, which usually started, uh, depending on when her garland reba opened up, which was about 7 in the morning. And it would go to about 4 in the afternoon, 3 or 4, and then we'd come in for the second shift, 4 to 10 or 11, whatever we were working at that time. She worked days, 
and I was working the evening. I can't remember it quite as well as she can, but it made an impression on me. Apparently, I called in sick somewhere during the daytime. She had plans for the evening, and I think she had planned on going square dancing with Garland and Rita. I think she had plans. But she had to stay over and work for me because I didn't show up for my shift. So apparently, at some point in time during the evening, concerned about how Jeff was feeling, they decided to call home to check on me. And when they called home, and I don't know who they was, I think it might have been Miss Alice. I didn't answer the phone. My girlfriend did. <laughs> Apparently, I was too sick to work, but not too sick to court. <laughs> and that made an impression on Miss Alice. Minus. Maybe that's what she saw in that picture. There's the guy that left me hanging on the evening when I had plans. I had to work for him because he said he was sick. But apparently, he was not. Is that the first time anything like that happened in my young life? Actually, Miss Reba caught me one night when apparently I wasn't able to go to work because I had too much homework, but I ended up at a church league softball practice of which Deanne's dad was the pitcher. I'd like to think that in this day and age, those incidences are the exception to my life and not the rule. I hope the Lord has had some free reign in my life to where truth is the rule of my life. But here's the thing about that. If there's something out there that we want badly enough, we, even as Christians, still have an old sin nature inside of us that desires to please itself. And if it in you can't get what you want, and if you want it badly enough, one of the places that the enemy would like to take you is just stretch the truth, alter it in some way to fit your need, or just flat out lie to obtain it. We can do it to serve and please ourselves, or we just might be tempted to lie to slow someone else down or stop their progress or hinder them in some way, shape, or form. It's, listen, that sin nature is still in there. And we have said before that there are three common enemies that we all face in Christ. Our common enemy, the devil, who likes to take the things of this world and entice this sin, self-pleasing nature. Now, let's back up to Nehemiah. Because two weeks ago in chapter 4, we shared about the opposition from without. And there were names that were attached to these people that we've heard them and we heard them again today already. Last week in Nehemiah 5, we talked about some of the problems that the people were facing from within. Rich, wealthier Jews were exploiting their own and taking unfair advantage of them through a baloning of money and these extravagant interest rates that people couldn't pay. They were having to sell their children, even themselves, into slavery. Now you would think even within that, God's strength and provision and confidence and capability continues to further the wall toward completion. You would think we're close. So the enemy, through opposition, has determined I'm done. And he resigns himself to the fact that he's been defeated. No, 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 no. That's not the way this is working. As we read here in Nehemiah 6, we're finding out now there's a new target. It's not the people in general as they're working on the wall. The enemy is going after Nehemiah as he will choose to do you. John chapter 8, 44 defines and captures and describes our common enemy like this. He is a liar. He is a deceiver, devil. He doesn't know how to do anything else but lie because that is who and what he is. That's who he is. 
And in Peter's writing in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8, he describes the enemy like this, like a lion on the prowl. Now, a pastor friend of mine a few years ago took that verse, and he was very quick, an emphatic way to describe it like this. He said, listen, when you think about the enemy, he's not a lion, but he prowls like one. What and who is this lion of an enemy looking for? He's looking for you. What's he looking for in you? He's looking for vulnerability. And what's he desire to do? To hinder you, to take you down. He'd take your life if he had that right and authority, but he does not. He is a created being with definite, defined limitations. And he's defeated. And with that in mind, knowing that he knows his end. You might think he resigns himself to that as a defeated foe, and he just lay back when actually he wants what you have in Christ, and he hates you because of who dwells inside of you and who you have trusted your heart and life to. We cannot give up or give in. And that's why the example of this Nehemiah is important. We're not here to become Nehemiah followers today. We're here to become Christ followers, more deeply appreciative and more willing and committed to get in line and to follow him. So what are some things today that we can see in Nehemiah as he now has become the primary target? Well, let's read a little bit further. We're going to try with the Lord's help today to cover... 14 verses, we've got a verse and a half already behind us, and then we'll move forward because we're going to see some of the strategies of, the, of our common enemy and what he desires to do and use against us as God's children. You'll recognize them, and at the end today, I think we'll be able to back up and look at, listen, one of the greatest benefits of being a Christian and one of the most important things to that greatest benefit. That's where we hope with the Lord's help today to land. So here we back in Nehemiah chapter 6. Here we are. In verse 2, Sanballat, Geshem the Arab, they sent to Nehemiah, and here's what they attempted to do here in the beginning. They sent this message to him saying, Come, let us meet together among the villages in the plain of Ono but they thought to do me harm. So I sent messengers to them saying, I'm doing a great work so that I cannot come down. Why should the work cease while I, while I leave it and go down to you? But they sent me this message four times and I answered them in the same manner. Strategy of the enemy. Basically, Levy toward Nehemiah. Compromise and cooperation with the adversary. What the adversary, what our common enemy, the devil, would try to do to you is to begin to plant thoughts in your mind that would isolate you from other people. I had this conversation this morning very briefly. And it kind of seems that the Lord is kind of setting a tone for some things. One of the ways that our enemy would like to deal with us when times in life get tough is he would like to whisper thoughts into your mind that would migrate about 12 inches from mind to heart and begin to set up patterns of living. And here's what he'll say to you during midst of hardship. He'll say, you know what? You're the only one suffering like you're suffering. You're the only one out there. Who, who, who can help you? Who, who knows other than you? You're going through something here and you're all alone. Woe is you. And he'll begin to say these things to you. And you'll buy into that in such a way that you'll begin to wall yourself off from other people because you'll start to believe that mistruth and misstatement. You'll start to think, you know what? I am actually out on this limb on my own. I am by myself. 
No one will understand me. No one can help me. And we begin to buy into that. And then we stop reaching out. We stop staying close. And then before you know it, isolation has become insulation. And then frustration leads to despair and depression. My goodness. We, listen, we've got to capture those thoughts. The Bible says we can take captive those things. If we are willing to stay close to our Heavenly Father through His Word, and if we are willing to continue to reach out to our Christian kin and remain encouraged by their words of help and hope, then we're less likely to buy the lie. Our common enemy, the devil, would like to lead you out on the limb. He would like to convince you that you're out there all alone. He would also like to hand you a saw or a clipper and you just go ahead and clip your own limb off while you're out there if he could do that. He has no interest in you. He will approach you as if it feels initially like he wants to help you, as if he feels sorry for you when all our common enemy desires to do is trash you. That's who and what he is. He is a liar and a deceiver. The truth is not in him. And the closer that we stay to Father God and God the Son Jesus and God Holy Spirit, the closer we stay through the Word and through prayer and the fellowship and warmth of our kingdom family members, the less likely we'll be to buy that lie. You see, when we begin to look within ourselves and we start to take pity on ourselves, listen, that actually is a very self-centered way to look and think. And when we decide to compromise and cooperate with our common enemy, he wants to change the rules. You see, Jesus took the law, there was about 613 of them total in the Old Testament, and he took those, and listen, those all kind of formed out of the ten. When Jesus arrives on the scene in the New Testament, he basically says all of those can be summed up in two. Love me with everything, heart, mind, soul, and strength. And then love your neighbor as yourself. He said all the law hangs on those two. Listen, that's outward. That is selfless and sacrificial. But when we buy into the lie, as if our life suddenly becomes all about us and we become an Eeyore type of a, oh, woe is me, because we have collaborated and compromised with the enemy and not pressed in close to our Heavenly Father. Listen, the enemy wants to change the rules so that it's no longer selfless. It's selfish. And about collaborating with the enemy, Turn with me quickly, if you will, to 2 Corinthians chapter 6. 2 Corinthians 6. When you find 2 Corinthians 6, we're going to start at verse 14. You've heard at least one of these verses quite often. We're going to read verses 14, 15, and 16. And I'd like to ask you a question. Paul writes this under the leading of Holy Spirit, 2 Corinthians 6, 14. Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness? And what communion has light with darkness? And what accord has Christ with Belial? Or what part has a believer with an unbeliever? And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk among them. I will be their God and they shall be my people. The number of times that I have used this verse working with teenagers over the years when we've talked about dating and marriage. Listen, it is so important. Your faith and your belief system are important. And we center upon the person of Jesus Christ. 
I've got no problem as a youth leader for years and years basically expressing this as quickly and as emphatically as I possibly can. If you're a Christian, try your best. Listen, date Christian. If you're a Christian, strive to marry Christian. And if, if, if there is a relationship here and you're Christian and they're not, you need to step back and you need to evaluate that. If it's just a dating relationship, you've got to consider how this could affect you. If a marriage is already taking place, I would encourage the Christian spouse to remain faithful to Christ and to remain that shining light and that salt in that relationship that God could use you to speak to them. But the fact of the matter is here, this particular passage of Scripture doesn't just, it doesn't just apply to dating and marriage. This is any type of a relationship that a Christian would establish that would involve time, investment, emotion, or finance. Any type of a binding relationship needs to be considered in order that a Christian and a non-Christian would come together in such a way that the Christian's influence and testimony could be corrupted because moral and spiritual boundaries could have been crossed. May not have thought that in the beginning, but it's possible. When Paul wrote this, he said, you've got to consider this. Don't be unequally yoked with an unbeliever and consider what type of relationships he could be referring to here. Listen, consistency in this particular day and age is so vitally important in the life of the Christian because the world apart from Christ is looking for the real deal. And if we're stumbling constantly because we have an affinity for the things of this world that are starting to supersede our relationship with Jesus Christ, the world apart from Christ has every right to step back and say, this seems to be so unstable and wishy-washy. I don't need this in my life right now. I need something, someone sure. And their life's example just doesn't seem to be adding up at all. How unfortunate, tragic it would be to misrepresent, misrepresent the person in the name of Jesus Christ like that. We have got to be consistent and resist the temptation to compromise and collaborate with anyone or anything that is not of God. The plain of Ono in Nehemiah 6 was about 20 miles northwest, I believe, of Jerusalem. Here was Samballot and Geshem's, uh, uh, this was what they wanted to try to pull off. If we can get Nehemiah far enough away from home, we can ambush and kill him on the way. Nehemiah, with the help of the Lord, was able to discern what was truly taking place here. And he didn't go. What was his response? The work's too important. I'm remaining focused to the task at hand as to why God led me here. Why would I want to leave the work and come to you? Why would I want to stop things from progressing in order to do this? And God enabled him to see that. He knew what they were trying to do. They thought to do him harm. He knew that. We have this measure of discernment inside of us, and we'll come back to that in just a little bit. But also look here at verse 4 before we move on. It says, they sent Nehemiah this message how many times? Four times. Which ought to tell us a bit about the personality of our common enemy. He doesn't give up easily. They sent the message. Nehemiah didn't come. They sent it again. Nehemiah didn't come. They sent it again and again. And he didn't. Our common enemy can be unrelenting. And we've got to be prepared for that. The lion, he prowls. He's looking for vulnerability. When we start to appear to be isolated and oppressed, he's not coming to help you. He's coming to devour if he can. Church, remain close. No compromise. No cooperation with the enemy. We have the Holy Spirit of God living inside of us. 
He is that spirit of truth. John 14, John 15, John 16. How thankful are we that we have him inside of us to call these things out. Verse 5. Then Samballot sent his servant to me, Nehemiah, as before, the fifth time, with an open letter in his hand. And in it was written, and this is what the letter said, it is reported among the nations, and Geshem, the Arab, says, that you and the Jews plan to rebel. Therefore, according to these rumors, this is why you're rebuilding the wall, that you may be their king. That's quite a stout accusation. Verse 7, And you have also appointed prophets to proclaim concerning you at Jerusalem, saying, There is a king in Judah. Now these matters will be reported to the king. So come, therefore, and let us consult together. In verse 8, Then I said to him, saying, No such things as you say are being done, but you invent them in your own heart. For they all were trying to make us afraid, saying their hands will be weakened in the work, and it will not be done. And here was Nehemiah's prayer, and I love this about him. Now, therefore, O God, strengthen my hands. So if the temptation to compromise and cooperate with the enemy didn't seem to work, and it did not here, then the next strategy of the enemy that he may choose to use with us is to entice us to be victims of slander or rumor, or, heaven forbid, we would be enticed to be gossipers or slanderers. Look at how this is all kind of playing out here. This is interesting. Well, we couldn't lure him 20 miles away from Jerusalem, so now we'll just run down his reputation. John 10 and 10 is an interesting verse, and there's a lot in it. For the enemy comes but to steal, kill, and destroy Jesus said in that verse also, but I have come that you may have life and have it more abundantly. When I think about the first half of that verse, steal, kill, and destroy, only God in heaven has the right of authority over your life as if, he could take, as if it could be taken. He giveth it, only he can take it. But when I think about steal, kill, and destroy, that need not only apply to the cessation of physical life while we're here. Because when people choose to lie about others, things will start to die. And look at how this all started here. How sly, how sly Sam Ballot and this servant carrying this letter were. Was there anything distinctive about the letter being opened and not closed? Some commentators say this. The reason that the letter, which had some pretty... Listen, these were quite inflammatory, okay? All right, Nehemiah, we know what you're doing and we know why. You're only rebuilding the wall around that city so you can be the man, okay? <laughs> you, we get it now, okay? You came and you appear to be humble and so sincere about trying to refortify Jerusalem so the people could be reestablished, but really it's all about you, Nehemiah. You, you're wanting to be the king. Let me tell you how that's going to play out with Artaxerxes. Wait till the king of Persia gets word of this. Listen, you, you and I, Nehemiah, we need to sit down and talk about this. You see how this all works? What was the purpose of the open letter? It would have taken a while for that letter to have reached its destination once it had been formed. If you leave the letter open, get this, there's every reason to think that someone's curiosity might have gotten the best of them. You've got an open letter laying there that may have some really juicy gossip in it. And sometimes, folks, we just can't keep away from that. Oh my goodness. They said what? They did what? 
Hold now you now, listen, I've got something here on somebody. You, you promise you won't tell anybody, will you? Oh no, no. It's good with me. <laughs> the open letter. Listen. In and of ourselves, again, sin nature working itself out of us, unfortunately, as Christians. Aren't we all capable of being that open letter? I mean, come on, church. We're, we're all here in this together today. It comes home to all of us from one time or another. And that open letter had some things in it. And essentially, again, since they could not lure Nehemiah, far enough away from Jerusalem to get him away from his protective covering there, then what they decided they would do is, hey, we'll just go after his reputation. Church, here's the question, and then we'll move forward. What is there any element to your Christian life to which you carry with you day to day that's worth more than your reputation? How willing are people to listen to what you have to say if your character and integrity have been called into question because of a misstatement or a wrong deed, slip of the tongue, lapse of judgment? It takes us years of, listen, not perfection, but consistent faithful obedience. It won't be perfect, but it should be the rule of our life as a Christian. That's how our light for Jesus Christ shines the brightest. But isn't it true that what we may have taken pains with for years and years and years can be torn down in a moment? So Sanballat forms the letter. It's not true. But he leaves it open. And he's just hoping that on the way, somebody will read it, and then the rumor mill will start to develop and spread. And oh, this is really juicy stuff. Nehemiah, we need to meet about this. There's a word for this. This is interesting to me. It's called sedition. What's that mean? It means that would be a charge leveled against anyone who intentionally tried to incite the people against the ruling party who was seated at the time. If you wanted to form opinion or anti-sentiment toward the king, the monarch, or whoever, and you started rallying the people against them, that was called sedition. It was illegal. What they're trying to do here and create in the reputation of Nehemiah is the same thing that they, the Romans, were going to accuse Jesus of when they finally relented to having him crucified. The Jews said, blasphemer. He says he's God. The Romans could have cared less about what the Jews believed religiously. But when it came to the point to where the religious leaders, the Jews, said, well, he says he's a king, then that got underneath Roman jurisdiction. Now we can accuse him and crucify him for being a sedition. What a strange correlation here as to what they're trying to accuse Nehemiah of doing. But Nehemiah here in verse 8, you're just inventing this in your own heart. They were trying to discredit Nehemiah, and in doing so, the people would weaken and cower because their leader's reputation had been undermined. Hey, they still weren't done. From compromise and cooperation to slander and rumor, and now cowardice that would lead to disobedience. Look at these last few verses, and then we'll close. Verse 10, afterward I came to the house of Shemaiah, the son of Deliah, the son of Mehetabel, who was a secret informer. And he said, let us meet together in the house of God within the temple, and let us close the doors of the temple, for they're coming to kill you. Indeed, at night 
they'll come to kill you. And I, Nehemiah, said, should such a man as I flee? And who is there such as I who would go into the temple to save his life? I'll not go in. Nehemiah said in verse 12, then I perceived that God had not sent him at all, but that he pronounced this prophecy against me because, now get this, because Tobiah and Samballot had hired him. For this reason, he was hired that I should be afraid and act that way in sin so that they might have cause for an evil report, that they might reproach me. And then Nehemiah's prayer, my God, remember Tobiah and Samballot according to these their works and the prophetess Noadiah and the rest of the prophets who would have made me afraid. This Shemaiah was a false prophet, okay? A prophet for hire, all right? We see there who hired him, okay? Tobiah and Samballot. Here's where it gets a little bit tricky and it gets kind of close to home. He, Shemaiah, was the son of of a priest friend of Nehemiah. You know, we talked about this intermingling of opposition in and out. There were some key members of Nehemiah's working parties that had connections to the people outside of Jerusalem. This could be really, really sensitive. And you see what they're trying to do here now regarding Nehemiah's reputation? They're trying to lure him inside the temple into the holy place. And what they tried to do was to lie. Nehemiah, they're going to kill you. And the only safe place for you to go is into the holy place of the temple. Lock the doors and get in there. It's the only place we'll be able to keep you safe. Nehemiah knew better than that. Why? Because if it involved going into the holy place, there was only one man, the high priest, that could go in there at certain times of the year, and the priest that would serve in the temple. Nehemiah was neither. He would end up being appointed a governor there, a cupbearer to King Artaxerxes. But the fact of the matter was Nehemiah knew he was not allowed to be in that area. And he was not, not going to disobey his God because if he did, that would create doubt amongst the people. And then the hands that they were using to work would weaken because potentially their disappointment along the way. Again, Think about the value of your reputation and your name. Turn with me quickly as we begin to close. I want you to turn to Proverbs chapter 22. Very quickly. Proverbs 22 verse 1. writer says this in Proverbs 22 1, a good name is to be chosen rather than great riches, loving favor rather than silver or gold. What about the name you have? Well, I, I, I have a given name. I have a legal name by which I'm known. I, I, I'm Jeff DeBoer. They don't carry weight here or there. I've got a middle name, Lee. Jeffrey Lee the board. I've got social security numbers. I've got other identifications, passwords, and all these kind of things. But what the Bible is trying to say here is the value of the name you carry is based on your character and your reputation. And if we move forward from here into the 11th chapter of Acts, and we don't have to turn there right now, we're going to find that at church in Antioch, those believers in Christ were first called Christians there. Every single day, church, we are bearing the best of names. We are stewarding the best of names. We have been entrusted with the name above every name because if you profess Christ and you are willing to say you are a Christian, you are making a definitive statement there. You are a Christ follower. And how we follow him in the course of our day makes a great deal of difference. And Nehemiah knew that if he could buy into this lie, that there was a plot to murder him and that where he needed to go would be the only safe place. But in doing so, his character and reputation amongst his own people would be called into question. He knew he couldn't do that. It wouldn't be worth it. In fact, it wasn't true. 
Remember where you walk. Remember the things that you say. Remember the inflection of the tone of your voice. Remember how you carry yourselves in front of others where you may not even be in conversation with them directly, but people may be watching you from a distance. Listen, this is not meant to create stress. There's a heightened expectation when we say we're a Christ follower, but we've been built and empowered for the very opportunities that God provides us to model him to a lost and dying world. Here's where we can end this today. Miss Brenda, if you wouldn't mind to come up and just prepare a form of time of response. At the beginning today, having looked at this in Nehemiah 6, and how Nehemiah was able to uncover and expose these things as they came up, if you went back and you began to look at these verses of Scripture in Nehemiah, there are some things there that Nehemiah would, would know. You know, he understood that they thought to do him harm. In verse 8, he understood that they invented these things. And then they went on like that. And he, he perceived in verse 12 that God had not sent them at all to him. All of these things, we can step back and look at the life of Nehemiah. And we can realize that Nehemiah had a great quality and characteristic. And it's God-given. In fact, there are two. When we surrender, when we trust our heart and life to Jesus Christ, and this is kind of the evangelistic slant of the message today, because if you don't know Christ, we implore you, you need to know him. Because if we're going to step out into a fallen, darkened world, only Christ can enable us to navigate through this world in a way that's effective for our best, but also provides an opportunity for others to see Christ in us. So what's he provide? He provides two things. The Bible says godly wisdom is worth more than anything. Anything at all. Uh, we can see that in Proverbs. He, he, he provides that for us. The Bible says if you don't have godly wisdom, all you have to do is ask. If you've got everything in the world, essentially, this is kind of a paraphrase, it would be worth the exchange if you sold it in order that you could get it. It's worth that much. So godly wisdom comes to the Christian at the point we trust our heart and life to Christ. Because godly wisdom comes to us in the form of a person, Holy Spirit, living in us and with us, John 14, 17. So he's in there. The wisdom of God enables us to take the word of God and apply the word to our life so that we'll know what to do and how to react and where to go. But before wisdom, there's this discernment. When I talk about wisdom being worth more than anything, discernment actually could be the most important part of the most valuable thing. Because discernment with Holy Spirit enables us to know the difference between right and wrong. Is it holy? Is it not? Is it good? Is it not good? Discernment enables us to see that immediately. And then the wisdom of God comes in behind that and enables us to know, okay, here's how you are to react or where you're going to go from here. And those two qualities are not possible in the life of the human being apart from us knowing God personally through faith in Jesus Christ. So the question that we offered here a few weeks ago to someone who may be genuinely seeking truth, who doesn't know Christ, but wants to consider him for their life, is this. Isn't there someone out there or some way of managing your life better than the way you are? Because I can tell you there's a God in heaven who loves you unimaginably and is willing to provide you all the help that you need to be able to push through and to come through in a way that you've grown and matured and that you're better prepared for what else may be coming down life's way. Their answer to that, if they're logically thinking at all, is... I'd rather not manage my own life myself because that would become very stressful. But knowing that there is a person who comes to take up residence inside of us at the moment we trust our heart and life to Christ should come as great comfort and encouragement because he's there to live through you the life that you can't live on your own. And wisdom and discernment are so precious to us because they enable us to live for Christ. Paul said it like this in Philippians 4, often quoted. 
For I can do all things through Christ who gives me my strength. It's him in and through you. It's an undeniable relationship where he'll never divorce you, never leave, nor forsake. And he'll be there, Holy Spirit. His primary role is to testify to the person of Jesus Christ. And he will bring the things of Christ out of his word to our heart and mind. So we'll know whether to go to the right or the left when the opportunity presents itself. You don't have to figure it out on your own. And the closer you stay to him day to day as a Christ follower will enable you to remain more sensitive so that discernment and wisdom can work together in a way that will lead you accurately and you'll know it as you step out in faith to follow. So today, church, the question here is, do you know Christ in the free pardon of your sin? And if you do, is there a desire for you to know him better? The Christian life is meant to be a growth process. I've heard people say, if you're not growing and moving forward, you're in a backslidden condition. That's kind of strong, but I can see it if you examine it. But here is the truth. You have someone living in you, if you know Christ, who desires for you to grow, wants to lead you to the Word, wants to make the time and provide you the wherewithal to be in the company of other Christian brothers and sisters when we can gather together. And even on those occasions where the Lord may choose to bring someone here who doesn't know Him personally in order that we can help warm them up to Him through fellowship and already prepare them for the time of response. And there's a mark out there today and in this week that God desires to make through you. Where will it be? And what will it be? Wisdom with discernment will pay that way. Do you know him today, church? Do you know him? Do you want to know him better? What is it that the Lord desires to do in and through you today? I'm going to pray. Then we'll open up a time of response. This altar up here is open. I'll be standing here. I'll be considered to the distance. We can stay after the service and talk. Whatever you feel the Lord may require of you today, hey, let's let him. That's wisdom and discernment. Let's let him. Father, thank you for the time you've provided. And now, Father, it's your time to move. Change, Father, in a way that we'll leave here different. Have your way in our hearts and minds and lives. That's our prayer, and we ask all this in Jesus' name.